take a closer look. How would your client like to be referred to by the court? This is Dave please, Your Honor. In West Palm Beach, Florida, a woman is walking her bike across a drawbridge when it suddenly and tragically opens. She falls to her death, and now the drawbridge operator is facing criminal charges. This report is going to be the final say as to what happened. On the docket tonight in Broward County, Florida, the Parkland School shooter has already admitted murdering 17 people, but he will still have a trial to determine his sentence, life in prison or death. I believe it's your decision to decide where I go and whether I live or die. Plus, South Carolina has cleared the way for the use of the firing squad for executions. South Carolina also has two other options, lethal injection and the electric chair. Tonight's 13th Your Question. Do you think convicted killers should be able to choose their own mode of execution? <laughs> Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of Closing Arguments starts right now. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. It's great to have you with us. I want to start tonight by telling you the story of Lori and Chad Daybell, the so-called doomsday couple. This is a couple where I think you have to understand the relationship to understand where they are now and what they are facing inside of a courtroom. Um, these two, when they met, were both married and both of their spouses subsequently died, okay? We kind of know how one died, the other one's a little more questionable. Uh, but these two came together and it really became a love affair for these two, so focused on one another and it just became about them. But I wanna go back in time now so you can have a clearer picture under what circumstances that they actually met one another. Melanie Gibb is, is or was one of Lori's best friends. And she was there when all this was happening, when Lori met Chad. Take a listen. Do you have a recollection when Mr. Daybell and, and Lori Vallow met? Yes. And you were present for that meeting, is that correct? Yes. And was that in, um, uh, was that in Arizona? No, as you recall, I said St. George, Utah. That was, oh, that was on the 26th of 2018 in St. George. What, that's correct. Okay. And again, the, uh, uh, the October 26th at St. George, did that have religious overtones as well? Yes. And, and that was also somewhat sponsored by the LDS church, is that correct? Not by the church, by individuals. Okay. But the, the theme of that was consistent with what your uh, uh, religious faith is, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And are you telling me that on October 26th, Mr. Daybell was there as well? Yes. And Mr. Daybell, do you recall what his topic was at that time on October of 2018? Yes, he talked about the different visions he had of what he saw was going to happen in the last okay. days. He was the prophet and she was enamored with him and they began this relationship, this affair. And as I said, both of their spouses were gone. What's, what's really fascinating here is that she had two children, JJ and Tylee. And at the time she is with Chad Daybell, um, suddenly the children are missing, the children are gone. What we know now is that the children were killed and buried. And, and a lot of times what's interesting is that when there's a couple that's together and, and children go missing, sometimes it draws couples apart. It creates a problem. It creates fiction, a friction in the relationship because there is, there's, there's heartbreak for the children and there, there's arguments or there's despair, there's depression, all these things that happen when your children go missing. And we've seen it tear apart people and tear apart relationships. In this case, though, again, focusing on the relationship between Chad and Lori, when J.J. and Tylee, her children go missing, they are now drawn closer together. And they end up getting married and going on their honeymoon while her kids are missing, ultimately found buried in his backyard. 
unbelievable when you think about how this relationship developed. This is when they decide to get married, when her kids are totally out of the way. Now, when investigators were in Chad Daybell's backyard, looking and digging up, Chad was a free man. Lori was in jail. But as investigators are digging up the bones and remains of JJ and Tylee, Chad is on the phone with Lori. Take a listen. <laughs> And you hear their little giggles at the end of that call. Thanks for calling. I'm so glad you called. You know, let's pray. They're still together. That relationship seems very tight at that moment when she's in jail and he is free. But he knows and she knows that they're digging up the backyard at that moment. Well, after they dig up the backyard and, and find the remains, now they're both locked up, both charged, implicated in the murders of her children, and now we're getting ready for a murder trial. So the question tonight is, where is that relationship now? Now that they've been separated, as they have their own legal teams, separate defenses, whatever it's going to be, we still don't know exactly what each one will say inside the courtroom, but I, I noticed something, and this, I think this is really, it could be telling, it, it might be nothing. But there was a, a, an appearance where Lori is in court, and we've done this all throughout the story. What's her name? Is it Lori Vallow, Lori, uh, Lori Noreen Vallow, Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell, Lori, De what's her name? What does she want to be called? She was asked by the judge. Take a listen to what she said. <laughs> The defendant is also present here in the courtroom. Counsel for defense, um, in the court pleadings, it designates Ms. Vallow, a.k.a. Ms. Daybell. How would your client like to be referred to by the court? Mrs. Daybell, please, Your Honor. Right. Mrs. Daybell. Mrs. Daybell, very specific. Okay, now we just noticed yesterday in the courtroom, Chad Daybell's attorney has to refer to Lori and it really jumped out to us here at Court TV when he was referring to Mrs. Daybell. Take a listen to what Chad's lawyer called Lori. <laughs> uh, the two cases as the court pointed out were uh, joined by this court. Uh, Subsequent to that, there was a order that put a stay on Ms. Laureen Noreen Vallow's case. Uh, I am not uh, afforded the opportunity to get any information about the status of the Laureen Noreen Vallow uh, uh, Daybell uh, matter, and I don't have information as to what her status is. First time, no Daybell. Second time, 
Oh yeah, Daybell. You know, it's, a, it's the lawyer, it's what the papers say. But what exactly is going on here? Because this hearing was about severance, okay? This hearing was about severance uh, inside the, the courtroom. And the judge denied that motion. Take a look at, at what the, the judge determined because Chad Daybell and his legal team, they don't want to be in the same courtroom with Lori, Noreen, Vallo, Daybell. All right, the judge says, having determined that the defense has not met its burden to persuade the court that a jury is likely to confuse evidence in this case, that the defense will be unable to meaningfully present defenses or that a jury is likely to base a guilty determination in this case due to the evidence of criminal disposition, the court must conclude that the case will not be severed. Further, the court concludes that a joint trial in this case will serve the interests of justice by providing for judicial economy and efficiency and avoiding possible inconsistent verdicts according, accordingly. Defendant's motion for severance on this basis is denied. So Chad is trying to, it splits Phil. Maybe not for the marriage, but for the trials, he's seeking splitsville, but the judge has denied it. So they will be tried together, together, uh, scheduled in January. But what's going on in this relationship, really, and, and how can it impact what happens inside the courtroom? Let's bring in our think tank to go through this. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor, and law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling. In Seattle, Washington, trial attorney Ann Bremner. And in West Palm Beach, Florida, former police lieutenant and trial attorney Rick King. Great to see everyone. To me, this whole case, this whole trial, this whole story, the murder of these two children is all grounded in the nature of this relationship between these two. But where does that relationship stand tonight? Where will it stand inside that courtroom? Ann Bremner, what do you think is going on here? Um, do you think that Chad and his team don't want Lori there because that's where they're pointing the finger. They don't want to be near her. And he's just out for himself at this point because he's not going into court saying it was all me. No, and, it, and that's where he's always been. Goodbye doesn't mean forever. Maybe just goodbyes for the trial, right? And then they can figure it out afterward. But he's in it for himself. He's in it to win it. And he wants to distance himself. And frankly, there couldn't be any prejudice in basically trying these two together because she's found and competent to stand trial, at least right now. But, you know, he's a very selfish guy. He's a prophet. And, you know, he's been able to basically bamboozle her. And she's still in that state, but he isn't. Yeah, I'm, you know what, Michael Sterling, I know we've been covering this story for a long time. We've done a lot of segments on it. I just see it right now. It's becoming clearer and clearer to me the way this is going to play out. And I'd be interested in, 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 in how you think that could impact verdicts in this case if Chad is going to separate himself from Lori and, and try to throw her uh, under the bus as being the one responsible, solely responsible, perhaps with her dead brother, but responsible for the murder of her own children. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly what's going to happen, Vinny. Uh, what, uh, whether Chad wants it to happen or not, his lawyers have probably counseled and advised him that if you want a punch your Wait, wait, stop on that, stop on that point right there, Michael. That's an important point. That's an important point that you're making. Um, do you think that this severance and everything is, is driven solely by defense counsel or do you think Chad is on board with it? And if Chad wants to be with Lori, does he get the final say on that, or is it up to his lawyer? Well, I'll say that the defendant always gets the say in terms of what happens, but ordinarily what happens in the course of these proceedings is you follow the advice of the lawyers, the skilled and qualified lawyers you've hired to represent you, who inform you, advise, counsel, encourage, and let you know if you've got a chance of winning the case, here are the things you have to do. Uh, and so while he's likely on board with his lawyer's strategy, certainly he's been persuaded and counseled by his lawyers that your only opportunity for a victory is to follow my game plan. Uh, and so, yeah, well, well, I think he's probably on board with it because, but it's he's on board with it because the skilled lawyers who actually know what they're doing are the ones advising and counseling him in terms of what he needs to do to win. 
Rick King, uh, John Pryor, when he's inside that courtroom, there, there's something about his presence in the courtroom. He tends to just take it over. He's one of uh, those types of defense attorneys. I've seen some extremely successful, uh, like he has been throughout his career. But where do you think the relationship stands right now? They've been separated for quite some time now. Lori's been locked up for years. He's been locked up. They're in separate jails, obviously. They can't communicate. Do you think the absence is making the heart grow fonder, or is reality setting in that I've got to get myself out of here? If you look back to the very beginning of this case, he, he put a spell on her in the beginning. And I think that she still remains very much underneath the spell of Chad Daybell. And I think Chad Daybell remains in love with or whatever they have together. Uh, ultimately, uh, Vinny, and I think you said this uh, in the very beginning where we talked about it, they're going to point toward the open chair, both of them. I think both of them point toward the vacant chair left by their brother, by her brother's death. And I think that's where they both point ultimately. Yeah, uh, he's dead. Alex Cox, the brother of Lori Noreen Valo Daybell. Um, the, uh, she had to be Lori Cox, I guess, at some point also. Um, I, I think she had a lot of husbands. Go ahead, Michael. Oh. No, I'll say I agree with Rick. I think they'll throw everything <laughs> against the wall. Whether <laughs> yeah. if it's Chad, his lawyers are going to say, whether you believe it was Lori, whether you believe it was Lori's brother, whoever you believe it was, it wasn't Chad. And Lori will likely do the same thing, Lori, uh, Lori's attorney, so on, on her behalf. So, you know, in defense counsel has an obligation, an ethical obligation, and I think it's important for the court TV audience to understand, to raise any specter of reasonable doubt. Uh, and so your obligation is to point to any potential alternative theory, alternative theory that cannot be excluded by the prosecution in order to raise reasonable doubt. Yeah, and, and Alex Cox is in the middle of all of this. I mean, he's in the middle of all of it. We know for a fact that he shot and killed Lori's husband. We know for a fact uh, that a prior husband of hers was, um, it was one of those uh, uh, like taser instruments that was applied to the right. the lower midsection of her prior husband he went to he went to jail for that um so there was something to that relationship as well is that do you think that becomes the focal point of chad daybell's defense and 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 trial is that you've got to focus on not the relationship between uh chad daybell and Lori noreen valo cox <laughs> Ryan Daybell, um, and you're going to focus on the brother-sister relationship. Correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, but, but wasn't okay. Alex Cox the last one seen with the kids? Uh, yes, by Melanie Gibb, was carrying uh, JJ. Ty Lee, they were all at the, right. all at the uh, park together. But the JJ, camp. yeah, was being carried. Melanie Gibb will testify to that. I think that's where they're going, and and I think that's going to be Chad Daybell's attempt to um, get out from under all of this, even though he is the prophet, and he's the prophet. <laughs> he's the prophet, but you know, I don't know why I keep thinking about Charles Manson. That's an old trial, but he, those girls, the Manson girls, remember, they just fell on their sword for him. He bamboozled everybody. Remember, they were singing and chanting and shaving their heads and on the corners in front of the courthouse and everything else. I mean, that... That was an amazing trial that, that basically they went hook, line, and sinker for, you know, the profit. All right, folks, this thing is, is happening. There's another hearing tomorrow we'll tell you all about. Uh, but the trial right now is scheduled for January 2023 in Idaho. When we come back, uh, Think Tank with us the whole hour, by the way, Michael Sterling, Ann Bremner, Rick King. But when we come back, a story out of, of Florida, incredibly tragic. A woman was walking her bike over a drawbridge. And somehow, some way, the drawbridge operator opens it and she falls to her death. Tonight, though, we're talking not about negligence. We're talking about an alleged crime. The drawbridge operator arrested and charged with her death. We'll break it down next.
Licensed everything. Uh, the woman tried to hang on. There was a bystander nearby who tried to help her, uh, but tragically she fell about five to six stories below where she died, uh, landing on concrete. Incredibly tragic, and he was talking about a woman, a 79-year-old woman from down in Florida who was walking her bike across a drawbridge and fell. Now, usually in a case like this, I would spend a lot of time talking about the woman who fell, the 79-year-old. I would tell you everything about her so you could remember the victim and understand the victim. But in this particular case, the, the victim's family doesn't want her name. So we will respect that on this program and on this network. So as you listen to the facts of the story, you may be thinking, well, why, why aren't we talking about the victim? That's because the family doesn't want us to. So uh, know that going in. Uh, WPTV is our affiliate down in West Palm Beach, Florida. They have more of the details of this incredible tragedy. This report is going to be the final say as to what happened. The bridge tender, Artishua Park, has been charged with manslaughter by culpable negligence. In her arrest report, she claims that she followed protocol by checking multiple times for pedestrians before raising the bridge. But West Palm Beach Police Department says there's evidence that tells a different story. There are a number of different camera angles from different sources that were... Um, taken into account for evidence and reviewed to corroborate the witnesses' statements. The arrest affidavit goes on to show that Park's supervisor, Kathy Harper, who is also her mother-in-law, told in a text to her cell phone to tell investigators she checked for pedestrians on the bridge. Harper then told her to delete the message. Detectives were able to determine what was on that cell phone, what had been deleted from that cell phone, what was relevant to the case. The victim's attorney, Lance Ivey, calls it a conspiracy. The disturbing part is the lengths that they are willing to go, again, to perpetuate a fraud um, against who wasn't here to give her side of the story. Despite Harper's involvement, West Palm Beach police say there are no other pending charges at this time. Ivy, though, says he is considering suing Harper as well. In fact, we find that there was some contributory negligence on her part. Um, that may be an avenue where she might be made a party to this lawsuit as well. All right, he's talking about a lawsuit. There are criminal charges in this case. That's what makes this case a little different. You know, you, you, you mess up, you, you do something that's not on purpose. Obviously, you should be liable for those damages. That's, that's civil law. Criminal law is, it's beyond negligence. Your conduct is so atrocious that your liberty should be taken away. That's what criminal cases are about. Let's bring back in the think tank, Michael Sterling, Ann Bremner, Rick King. This is in your backyard. This is in your backyard Literally down in, my West, backyard. in West Palm Beach. So interested in your thoughts about this case, this story, and the fact that this is now a criminal case. So in my backyard is an understatement that that bridge is probably actually less than a mile from my office and probably a mile and a half from my house. Um, so it's definitely in my backyard. And when you hear about the case locally, you know, one of the things that, because, um, you know, obviously we've, we've spoken about the case. I spoke, I spoke with colleagues this evening. And what we talked about was, so when you think about uh, manslaughter and by culpable negligence, you think about something where it is so reckless and so egregious that you knew or should have known what was going to happen. In this case, what she didn't do, what, what this woman didn't do, was she didn't go out and check. She, she never went outside, and she never looked around, and they were able to establish that by camera angles. Um, and then she, so probably the, what she did that probably got her charged was she lied. When they asked her about it, she lied. And that's why she's in criminal court today, I believe. Um, the, but the charges aren't the lying. The charges aren't lying. You're saying because she lied, they said, oh, okay, we're going after you? Because it has some sort of, it's an air of just, uh, of 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 a misdoing, you know, of, of a misdeed. So she lied because, well, most likely she lied because she was scared, but she didn't do what she was supposed to do, and that's clear. You're supposed to walk out there, and then the, the supervisor slash mother-in-law gives her terrible advice to lie and then try to hide the evidence. And those things all together will get you charged. Michael Sterling, this is... 
this is, we talk about this issue a lot, uh, and we've had a few cases here at Court TV where you have conduct that is not on purpose. She didn't wake up, she didn't want to harm anyone, uh, but she did because of her actions. Those are the allegations, right? So, Michael, is this the type of case that crosses over the line? Like um, prosecutors who prosecuted Kim Potter believed that she crossed that line into the world of criminal conduct uh, by not doing her job at work. Some people look at Alec Baldwin and say, no, no, you can't charge him. Um, how do you see this one? Because, again, we know she didn't go out there and intend to kill or harm anyone. Well, well, I wouldn't compare this this case to those two. Uh, I think this is this case is particularly distinctive. Uh, I think Rick raises good points, and it seems like he was leaning towards where I am, which is that you know she did multiple things that you probably would do in terms of warning people, uh, putting on the lights, saying three times, I believe that the bridge was coming up, doing some things, and she I think she failed to do one of the protocols, one of the three things that she would have had to do, which is actually go down to the balcony, look on the bridge and actually make sure no one was there. So she failed to do one of the three protocols that she would have been required to do. So I, I do think, Vinny, in terms of what she did do versus what she didn't do, this case does sort of cross over that line. I think it's something that really should be handled in civil court. Civil. So you say um, this should not be in the criminal court. Ann Bremner, let me ask you. I don't you. think so. And how do you compare her conduct versus Kim Potter's conduct, the police officer who thought she was shooting a, a taser but had her service weapon and killed and murdered, Don, and, and not murdered, but killed Dante Wright, and versus Alec Baldwin, who had a gun in his hand uh, that he thought was not loaded and, and shot and killed uh, Helena Hutchins. Well, they also they didn't mean it, but the fact is they're charged. I mean, they all were operating dangerous instrumentalities. Alec Baldwin shouldn't have like pointed a gun at somebody. You always assume a gun's loaded. You know that. You know, when you look at Kim Potter, you know, she definitely restrained and did the wrong thing and killed somebody. It's negligent. Alex, Alex Baldwin, negligent. What about this? You know, in, the fact that she lied after the fact is consciousness of guilt. She said, I killed a lady on the bridge that the police are here. And then she's basically trying to backtrack with her mother-in-law slash supervisor by basically saying, I'll say that I went and did all these checks, but she didn't. So I see these three cases as very similar. And when you're dealing with these kinds of situations, you cannot cut corners you, and you can't lie. And that's exactly what she did. Kim Potter didn't lie that I remember. And I don't know that Alec Baldwin lied. We haven't heard that full case yet. But this woman lied and she took a lie. And she wasn't careful. And that's criminal negligence because it's outrageous in this case. What happened? We will continue to track this one. Uh, again, these are the types of cases that are very difficult, but what I'm seeing in this country, and I, and I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, is I see prosecutors being much more aggressive in going after conduct that isn't like, okay, oh yeah, this is a crime. I mean, these are, these are cases that are in that gray area, and it seems prosecutors are leaning towards charging people now. Go ahead, Rick, I see it on the tip of your tongue. But, but when you look at these cases in the past, these, ca these culpable negligence cases, they are... Johnny was spinning the barrel of the gun and a gun went off and he shot somebody. He was doing something so reckless that he knew or should have known by playing with that gun, somebody could get shot. There's, I remember another case where a guy had a shotgun and he blasted into the side of a trailer and somebody was inside the trailer and he was convicted of manslaughter because he knew that there was an inherent danger to firing that shotgun into the side of that wall or the side of that building. These are, this isn't those cases. This person, and as Michael uh, actually very, very elegantly pointed out, that she did two of the procedures she was supposed to do. She didn't do one of them. But she's, I think she's on, and I, I think that she is on trial here or, or charged with the crime because she lied. Yeah. Because she lied to the police about what happened. And, and, and I, but I, I feel it. There's, there's prosecutors that are getting much much more aggressive on, on these types of cases. All right, they're staying with us, folks. Still ahead. On the docket tonight in Broward County, Florida, the Parkland School shooter has already admitted murdering 17 people, but he will still have a trial to determine his sentence. Life in prison or death. I believe it's your decision to decide where I go and 
whether I live or die. Plus, South Carolina has cleared the way for the use of the firing squad for executions. South Carolina also has two other options, lethal injection and the electric chair. Tonight's 13th year question, do you think convicted killers should be able to choose their own mode of execution? Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. Mode earning. On the docket tonight, the Parkland school shooter. He's already pleaded guilty to murdering 17 people, shooting 17 others, but he's going to have a trial. The trial is about one thing, his punishment. Will it be life in prison or will it be the death penalty? Now, when the Parkland uh, school shooter pleaded guilty 
Uh, he made a statement at the end of his guilty plea. Let's take a listen. I am very sorry for what I did, and I have to live with it every day. And that if I were to get a second chance, I would do everything in my power to try to help others. And I am doing this for you, and I do not care if you do not believe me. And I love you, and I know you don't believe me, but I have to live with this every day. And it brings me nightmares, and I can't live with myself sometimes. But I try to push through because I know that's what you guys would want me to do. I hate drugs, and I believe this country would do better if everyone would stop smoking marijuana and doing all these drugs and causing racism and violence out in the streets. I'm sorry, and I can't even watch TV anymore. And I'm trying my best to maintain my composure, and I just want you to know I'm really sorry. And I hope you give me a chance to try to help others. If, you, if I believe it's your decision to decide where I go, and whether I live or die, not the jury's, I believe it's your decision, I'm sorry. Well, it's clear to me that this um, killer wants to live, right? He wants to live, so he and his team, well, the defense attorneys obviously want to win um, in this case, because uh, I have never met a defense attorney that wants his client going to death row. So obviously they want to win as well. Uh, but it's clear, sometimes you have defendants like this who don't care one way or the other. But it seems that he does. But this trial, I don't think is necessarily going to be about him. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's going to be about him. I think it's going to be about um, the families of the 17 victims, the 17 other victims themselves who survived, and every other child in that school who now is, is out of that school. They've, they've grown up, but this is such an important case. Let's bring back in our think tank, Michael Sterling, Ann Bremner, Rick King. Uh, Michael, I, I think what this trial will look like and, and, and how it will play out is that it will be ultimately about the victims. I think they will so far overshadow anything or any evidence about this shooter, this killer, um, that I think that's what will will uh, manifest itself inside that courtroom just because of the massive numbers and the 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 horror of that day that was created uh, by this shooter. I think you're absolutely right, Vinny. Uh, there are a few tragedies uh, in our country that are more tragic than this. Uh, and I, I think what the prosecution will likely do in the penalty in the penalty phase uh, is remind the jurors or the people who will make the decision about each and every individual who lost their lives that day uh, as they push for the death penalty. They will talk about their parents, their hopes, dreams, their mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, and I think they will draw the attention to the victims and away from uh, the defendant himself as they push for the death penalty in this case. But I, I completely agree with you, Vinny. And Bramner, I can, I can, in my mind, picture that scene at the courthouse. You're just going to have, I think, hundreds of people there every day who are directly impacted and connected to what happened inside the school that day. Well, absolutely. It's just going to be a memorial service of epic proportions of the loss of these young lives, you know, 17 of them. And that statement, by the way, was the most self-serving, throw everything against the wall, as Michael just talked about, statement. Sorry, drugs, I can watch TV, I'll be better. You know, I, it's your decision, you know, I leave it up to you. I mean, that was terrible. So they don't want to have a focus on the defense. The defense is going to be on these families and what they've lost and their futures and their dreams. I mean, it's just horrific. And there are going to be a lot of tears. And, of course, there's never closure in a case like this. But it's deserved, and he needs to listen. Remember the Green River Killer out here when he was sentenced, killing 48 women? The judge had him turn around in the sentencing and look at all those families, and, and the judge said, this is the last thing I want you to remember. He got life in prison. But he had to look at them at the direction of the judge. I think it's very important. Rick King, uh, this is another one down in, in South Florida. Uh, close to where you are, uh, the impact on this case is immeasurable. Um, but this is going to be the, the 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 tone and everything about this case is so different, 
so different than in most trials uh, that we cover and most trials that take place in courtrooms day after day. Yeah, um, I can't I can't express to you what's taking place in preparation for what's going to happen on that particular day. Um, there is so much hurt and uh, so many emotions that are that are going to come spilling out. Um, I, I, it's just words don't capture what where this community will be on that particular date. Um, it's unfortunate uh, in that these families have to relive this entire process again, as they are, still will never get over the loss of their loved ones. Um, but this process is one that has to take place, and um, I don't see it turning out any other way. You know, Michael, I, I that Mr. absolutely. Um, go ahead, Rick. You can finish. I, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to just just conclude by saying I think that um, this is uh, I anticipate a unanimous vote in this. Absolutely. Well, here, folks, we've got the penalty phase. It, it, it begins uh, with the jury selection. That may take some time in this case, but it's um, April 4th. OK, penalty phase begins on April 4th. This case has been put off many, many many times. Uh, so I am pretty confident, as confident as you can ever be in a trial date, but I think this is when it's going to start. Uh, but I'm not sure how long it's going to take to find a jury. I mean, it could take um, several weeks because of the nature of this case. Okay, when we come back, we're still going to be talking about the death penalty because something happened in South Carolina. South Carolina had two modes of execution for a death penalty inmates. There was lethal injection and the electric chair. Well, now they have approved and greenlit a third manner, the firing squad. We'll talk about it next.
Okay, the electric chair, lethal injection, or the firing squad. Those are the three choices now in South Carolina. They just cleared the way for the uh, firing squad. They green lit it. So now three different modes of execution in South Carolina. Posted on social media and asked you this question. Should convicted killers have the option of choosing their own mode of execution? We begin with our 13th short comment of the day coming from Cynthia tonight. No, the families of the ones. who were killed or harmed should get to choose the way the convicted person dies. And Bremner, I'll begin with you. Um, firing squad now cleared in, in South Carolina. Uh, I want to get your reaction to that. Are you, are you surprised? No, I mean, it's South Carolina, and we've got a number of states, including Oklahoma and Utah, that have it, you know? So, of course, I was born in Oklahoma, but... Um, no, I was thinking about, you know, what's the most humane way to do it? I mean, that used to be considered to be the guillotine. You know, it means seriously, it was quick, you know, and it was used all the time. Um, and now we look at this, my state had death by hanging choice. I had a case as a DA where the individual went on and actually chose hanging, not in my case, but in the subsequent case that he had. So, I mean, what, what what's the worst thing? I don't know. I mean... They have to choose within 30 days, you know, as a part of the Eighth Amendment. When you say we're going to give you a choice, look at Gary Gilmore. Remember, he chose that in Utah, I think it was in 1977. And that was a huge book by Norman Mailer and a lot of media attention when he chose to go that way. But now it seems more popular. Any of these, I think, a family would choose, frankly, in a death penalty case to avenge the victim and their family, frankly. It's death. Kristen tonight. I don't see anything wrong with letting them choose. The result of all the methods is the same, kind of what Ann was saying there. Uh, Rick King, um, your thoughts about the death penalty? It, it seems we, we kind of like go in different, uh, we kind of go around in circles on this as to what, you know, is a humane way, what isn't a humane way, and we can do it this way, we can't do it that way. Um, down in Florida, they used to have the electric chair. They got rid of that, right? Mm -hmm. Did did. Did Ann Bremner say the guillotine? Is that what you said? She said that it's quick. <laughs> I did. That's what I they said sure. about it. That's what they said um, at the time. It was so quick. You know, um, if you're asking what my thoughts are on the death penalty, um, I'm hesitant and always, I always think back to all these cases that, that show up at the Innocence Project of these people who have last minute reprieves and last minute evidence comes out to show, and especially how those cases from years ago um, disproportionately affected black and brown people. So I'm really hesitant when, I talk, when we talk about um, the ultimate penalty. Um, however, I, the firing squad to me uh, just seems a little archaic. I mean, it just, it's just reeks of just, it's just terrible for me. I, I, I really dislike that. Um, and the reason that they say that they went to the firing squad was because they couldn't get enough of the lethal, lethal injection, uh, the, the, whatever they put in the, the, the medicine. Um, I know the, the Court TV covered a case for the last couple of months now about a doctor who had plenty of uh, lethal injection medicine they could have given away. So I find that just very hard to believe. I just, I just, it just doesn't sound, doesn't sit well with me. Shelby, tonight, I think they should be put to death in the same manner in which they murdered their victim. Um, Michael Sterling, we know that's never going to be happened, but that's a lot of, uh, of the public sentiment uh, surrounding the death penalty. But is there a difference in the manner in which it is, it is, it is done? I think there's at least some manner because, Vinny, I think what people have to realize is that this is your government putting you to death. So I think there's a difference between an individual action and what your government is allowed to do to an individual. Uh, so we have uh, 32, 33 states that allow the death penalty. I'm saying 33 because in 32 in New Mexico, I 
uh, they uh, banned it in 2009, but it wasn't retroactive. So individuals who were sentenced to death before then would still be eligible for the death penalty. Uh, and of those 33, 33, 32, 16 let you choose the manner of death, some being nitrogen hy uh, hy hypoxia, uh, which is basically like uh, a death by gas, others being lethal injections, and the ones who don't have the option are just lethal injection. Uh, so, you know, I think, Vinny, you know, the, the question really is, is like, what manner of death are we okay with our state, you know, the government actually administering? Because we have to be careful uh, when we're talking about individuals versus what we're gonna allow our government to do to us. Great job tonight. Michael Sterling, Ann Bremner, Rick King, thank you so much. We'll see you again really soon. Uh, don't go anywhere, folks. When we come back next hour, a woman abducted in a Walmart parking lot. I have some video to show you tonight. Don't go away. Right now.
in Lyons County, Nevada. Naomi Irion disappears from a Walmart parking lot. Investigators have surveillance video of the man they believe abducted her. Tonight, the latest in the investigation. Please save my daughter and bring her home. In tonight's unsolved case file in Chesterfield, Virginia, security guard Damian West was murdered as he was finishing up his shift. That was back in 2009, and still today, no one has been charged. We're not going to quit. He cannot sleep at night without looking over his shoulder. In Los Angeles, California, a man suspected of DUI forced to give a blood sample dies in police custody. We take a look at this tragic video with our own law enforcement experts. You're bringing the fight to this, not us. I'm not fighting it at all. And in Kenosha, Wisconsin, an officer working security in a middle school puts his knee on a 12-year-old girl's neck. Why would an officer put his knee on anyone's neck in 2022? We answer the question during crime time. Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of Closing Arguments starts right now. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us here on Closing Arguments. I want to begin this hour in a story out of Nevada. A young woman was at a Walmart. It was early in the morning. There she is. Her name is Naomi uh, Arion, just 18 years old, and was going there because that's where she picks up a, a bus to, to get to work. And she was spotted on surveillance video at a convenience store. And then he, she took her her car to the Fernelli, Nevada, Walmart to catch the bus so she could go to work. But she never came home from work that day, and her car was found nearby the Walmart days later. Now, there's a suspect, you're looking at him, uh, who was caught on video wearing a mask and a hoodie. He was seen approaching and apparently getting into Naomi's car around 5.23 a.m., on March 12th. Now, police are searching for this man along with a vehicle that they're looking for as well. It's a dark, late model, half ton Chevrolet 2500 high country pickup truck. So, this is the information that they are releasing now. So, what exactly happened here? You know, she's in her car getting ready to catch a bus, and this guy's kind of lingering around and, and apparently gets into her car and abducts her. Let me play for you um, the sheriff out in Lyon County, uh, Nevada. They had a, um, a public press conference because they need your help. They need your help tracking down this car, tracking down the suspect, finding Naomi. Let's take a listen. Well, we know uh, so far that we're able to release on uh, March 12th, 2022, at approximately 05, 09 hours, Naomi parts at the Fermi Walmart. Um, it's located at 1550 East Nail Drive in Fernley. At approximately between 05, 09 hours and 05, 23 hours, Naomi's active on social media, which is common according to her family. Um, at 05, 23 hours is her last Snapchat thing. Um, we know that uh, she was active on social media up until that point and active on her cell phone. At 05, 24 hours, the suspect approaches Naomi's vehicle. And at 05.25 hours, the only vehicle leaves the Walmart parking lot with a suspect driving the vehicle. On March 15, 2022, the only vehicle is recovered, and we're currently processing all evidence with that. Here's some still images from the video that's already been released. Uh, we will provide you guys all with a copy of these video or of these images and a copy of this video after this press conference. Uh, here's a quick video of the suspect walking. As you notice, it's been on uh, social media that there's the, the way the suspect walks, um, the, his clothing description, all that stuff is imperative to leading us to a possible identification of the suspect. Uh, here's a map provided to us from the FBI of Naomi's uh, cell phone mapping 
uh, images, basically showing that she was active at the Walmart parking lot between 05, 09 a.m. and 05, 25 a.m. Uh, Lyon County, with uh, assistance of the Washington County uh, Sheriff's Office, search and rescue, Lyon County Sheriff's Office, search and rescue has uh, conducted multiple searches through the air and on the ground looking for Naomi. Uh, the prior image, I'll back up that real quick. This cell phone mapping led us to an area um, off of Highway 427 and Hill Ranch Road in Wadsworth. That's why we were out there um, searching in the previous days. Lyon County uh, citizens have also done a search. Uh, everybody's doing everything they can right now to look for Naomi. Um, right now, our, our biggest thing is to reach out to the public. Who would have been in that Walmart parking lot, or should have been in that Walmart parking lot during the time frame that we released, uh, please contact us. If anybody knows somebody who has access to the vehicle that we're looking for, it's a 2020 or newer. 3500 high country model it's dark in color if you know somebody who has that vehicle or has access to that vehicle during this time frame please reach out to us um, we've been working with all agencies all over the nation uh, federal agencies and, and local law enforcement the thing i'd like to talk to is naomi's 18 years old she's approximately 5 foot 11 approximately 240 pounds she had brown hair and green eyes she has a septum piercing and piercings in both nose nostrils. Uh, she also has a smiley face tattoo on her ankle when you touch her with ankle. And she was last seen with a dark colored purse. The images that have been previously released show her clothing description of a blue Panasonic shirt. Um, she also had an iPhone on her person, AirPods, and she's known to carry a fidget spinner. Our uh, suspect that we released the videos and images of is an adult male, approximately six feet in height and the clothing description speaks for itself in the videos. Okay, there's a lot to go through here, and I really want to break it down piece by piece. Uh, let's bring in our investigators. Joining me tonight in Palm Springs, California, retired FBI special agent and producer of Indivisible Healing Hate, which is streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, Bobby Chacon is with us. And in Salt Lake City, Utah, retired police commander and host of the Profiling Evil podcast, Mike King, also with us. Great to see you both tonight. Um, Bobby, let, I, I want to start here with what we think happened and why we think that's what happened here. Let's go to that parking lot, that Walmart, 520 in the morning on March 12th. Uh, Bobby, I'll start with you. What do you, what do you think happened there? Well, uh, you know, this is conjecture, and I only know what's been reported publicly, but the gentleman on the video who they think was the guy that got into a car came from a nearby homeless encampment, or he was seen walking from the direction of a nearby homeless encampment. If he, in fact, lives there or lived there um, and was able to observe the morning routines of these people coming and going, and, and by accounts I've read, um, Naomi had a very specific routine. She parked in the same spot. She usually got there early so she could do some last minute social media posting um, before everybody else got there and before the shuttle over to her uh, employment came. So I think that she had a routine. I think this person may have observed the routine, may may have lied in wait and, and, and been waiting for her, knew that she'd be there early, knew she'd be alone if she's there that early, and then approached the car. There's some different uh, reporting on whether he forced his way into the car. He said something to her that made her move over to the passenger seat. Then he got into the vehicle and they drove away. Um, he could have threatened her. He could have brandished a weapon. We haven't seen that video. That video hasn't been out yet. Um, but I think that this, this guy knew the routine. He knew that she'd be there um, and he was lying in wait. Soon as she pulled up, he wasted no time in approaching her vehicle um, and, and, and abducted her. All right, um, Mike King. Let's pick it up from there. He, he, he gets inside the vehicle. Um, where are they going, right? The, the car is found relatively close to where they are. So what, what happens in the next phase of this? Because we're searching for him, we're searching for her. Um, what could have possibly happened between the time that they get into the car to the time that the car is then left behind and something else happens here? I agree with Bobby that this is an orchestrated, targeted event. The question is, was it a planned event, and could she have possibly been involved, that they were meeting to head off 
somewhere together. I think that's really less likely in this case, but it has to be considered as we think through this. But as part of this entire guise, uh, it appears that there is this um, this uh, opportunity to get in the vehicle. So it, does he say, hey, I need help getting something or can you help me jump a car? But somehow he gets access to this young woman, gets into her vehicle. It appears he then travels a short distance through the parking lot to where his vehicle is uh, waiting and then gets her into that vehicle somehow. I think the vehicle really is interesting, Vinny, when we start looking at what we're seeing and if the images are accurate and the descriptions are accurate. This is a three quarter ton pickup. So that's a little heftier pickup than most of us drive when they're throwing, when we're throwing our lawn clippings in. It might be somebody who pulls a horse trailer or something like that. And as we look at the way this person walks, uh, if we look at cameras in the area, especially at those grocery, at inside that Walmart or at the, the convenience stores around the area, I suspect that someone's got some video somewhere that would re really help police get a closer look at the face of this individual. But again, that truck's pretty unique. It's got uh, pretty shiny chrome wheels, which means it probably isn't a farm work truck, but it might be a truck that pulls horses around or something like that. Uh, so we start looking in the area. We start looking at things in the area like the registered sex offenders. And uh, it's not an indictment just because someone has had that background, but the state and Washoe County there keep very clear records of what a registered sex offender uses as a preferential victim. And and in, there are a batch of houses to start looking at. When I looked online, there were at least 76 registered sex offenders just in that immediate area. So there's there's some footwork that needs to be done immediately. And then you got to start looking at the uh, cell tower analysis that the Bureau has done and the azimuth or the direction that that tower was pointing and what kind of information can we start to extrapolate from that uh, to the point of the last ping on the phone and whether something can be gained from that. There's a ton of evidence available. It's just piecing this all together and it really boils down to somebody is gonna recognize that truck. They're gonna recognize that gate. I doubt that a three quarter ton pickup truck is traveling from Sacramento to Salt Lake City on that route that travels through there. It's probably gonna be somebody close by. Yeah, Bobby Chacon, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that area of the country. Now this is taking place in Nevada, but it's the part that's closer to Reno uh, rather than closer to Las Vegas. Um, what are your thoughts about that area of the country and, and, and how that helps or hinders this, this search for Naomi and the search for the suspect? Well, I think, Vinny, I think Vegas and Reno both have a certain um, transient population to them. They have people that come and go a lot and people that come and stay and lose all their money and, and then and then become, you know, a problem. But but I think that I think there's a, a certain transient population that visits places like that. Um, and so it, that makes it more difficult. Was this person just passing through? Mike just said that maybe the pickup truck is a tie to the local area. So again, Again, when we go back to a case like this, you want to, you have to, there's two worlds that we deal with. There's the world of the victim. Did somebody want to do this person harm? And there's the world of this location. So, so who frequented this location? Who frequented these places? So that's where your suspect pools come from. And then you look at the crossovers and, and who was in both those worlds and, or if there is anyone in both those worlds. Um, and so, you know, you know, you start with the car, you, you, you may have, we, we know from the police statement that they said, and they didn't say what it was, but they said there was evidence of a crime occurring in her vehicle. Um, we don't know if that's blood, DNA, we don't know if it's just broken things, like someone struggled in there and things got broken, but, but the statement was to the effect that there was evidence that a crime took place in her car, so maybe there was a struggle. Now, I was involved in a serial killer case where he abducted someone similar, but it was out of a coffee kiosk in Alaska, and he told the person, I'm not, I just want your money, I'm not going to hurt you, do what I tell you. So they say things like that to gain compliance, so we don't know what was said between the two of them, uh, whether he brandished a weapon, whether he said he had a weapon, whether he said he was only interested in, in, in money, we don't know any of that, but that's those are all possibilities on how he gained compliance, how he got her to move from the driver's seat where she was over to the passenger seat so he could get in and drive away. Um, we, we just don't know any of that yet. 
Let's take a listen to Naomi's family because they also spoke. You can't imagine what they're going through tonight, but let's listen. I want to ask everyone in the public, if you have seen this truck, even in the corner of your eye, oh, that's a big blue truck, please call Secret Witness or the Lyon County Sheriff Department. If you know of somebody who has a big blue new truck, with the chrome and all that details on it that's in the picture. Please call the secret witness or the Lyons County Sheriff's Office. So if you find any of that just laying out, please call. It could be vital to saving her life. And that's our number one goal right now. Please save my daughter and bring her home, please. Anything, any little tiny bit of information, please call. And if if anyone in the public has been or knows somebody that ha that was at the Walmart parking lot in Fernley between 4.30 and 5.30 a.m. on the 12th, um, please come forward. I don't care if you were just going to the store or whatever, get in contact with the Sheriff's Department. They need all the information that they can get. I don't care if you don't think it's significant. If you were there, it could be vital. No piece of information is too small to report at this point. Mike King, it is now March 22nd. This happened on the 12th. We're talking about 10 days. Do you think we are looking for the suspect and Naomi still in the same place? Or do you think we are searching for her in one place and the suspect somewhere completely different? These are so challenging because you think about the fantasy process that's going on in the, in the predator's mind when they go and stalk and then take a victim like this. It, it, it's really difficult to say, Vinny, because we don't know if that predator in their wacky mind somehow think they're having a relationship and they're trying to maintain and have an ongoing relationship where this person's trapped and being held against their will, or if they're a more sadistic kind of a predator that uh, could go as far as, as terminating life. And that's really a difficult thing to imagine and think about, but we have to consider that. And so law enforcement has to start establishing grid searches. They have to start looking at all of the information they have in databases. And uh, and they've got to be going through every bit of those cameras. I thought of Bobby's comment about gambling, and it really hadn't struck me, but uh, they've got to be talking to the casinos and getting all the video there, because this guy surely has worn the same clothes Clothing. He surely has worn that same pair of boots, and uh, he surely has been hanging around in that parking lot trying this in other places. While she may have been his preferential victim, he would have also been the kind of guy that would have taken some kind of a substitute along the way. Bobby, is there anything about the video of the suspect that would help to identify? Do you think if someone knew him, whether it was a, a friend or an acquaintance, would be able to recognize him from this video? Because like all these surveillance videos we get, you see something, but you don't see everything that you need. Well, I think there's a, a real possibility, that, and Mike's right, I think that I would be scouring every convenience store video, every gas station video from around there from the, you know, the days prior leading up to this event and even after. Um, because if he in fact came from that homeless encampment, he probably doesn't have much clothes and Mike's right, he probably has worn these clothes over and over again. So maybe he was standing in line at a, at a convenience store two days before this in those same clothes. So I think it's it's really important to get this video out there and it's more important to scour every video in, in, in the area for anything. Nothing is too small to review. I mean, it takes a long time and a lot of eyes to, to do that, but but that's what, you know, now that we know what he looks like, we know kind of not the face, but we know the clothes, you can match those clothes up to casino videos, convenience store videos, gas station videos, and and, and I'm sure that's part of, of the ma mountain of work that they're doing right now. A lot of work. Bobby Chacon, Mike King staying with us. When we come back, we're gonna open up tonight's unsolved case file. Uh, going back to 2009, Damian West, hardworking guy, work in the security detail in an apartment complex uh, overnight, ends up murdered. Um, this case needs to be solved. We need your help. Uh, when we come back, we're going to uh, try to understand a little bit more about what happened to Damien West. His mom will join us. Um, we'll be right back.
your own karma with Credit Karma. It is time to open up tonight's unsolved case file, and this is a case where somebody knows something. We know that for sure because there was more than one person there. There were a bunch of people there. There are people who are, I would put under the uh, dome of, of people of interest that were uh, at the scene of this case. And what I'm talking about is the murder of Damian West, hardworking young man who was working security, doing his job. Um, WTVR uh, reporter Laura French uh, has a look at what happened to Damien West. Feel right there. It's a walk. I come out here all the time, constantly. Patricia Blow has taken... It's been two years. ...for the last decade to be close to her son, Damien. Well, you picked a beautiful spot here. But on this day, <laughs> she takes it with the man she's confident... Well, you know I'm not quitting, right? We're gonna stop. ...will help lead her to the people responsible for putting him here. Is a security dispatch uh, car. It looked like it ran off of the road, ran into a tree. The vehicle running and everything. That don't look normal to me. The person still inside. Damien West would be found brutally beaten to death July 9th, 2009, 100 feet from the security vehicle he had been working out of hours earlier at Chesterfield's Ivy Walk apartment complex. They had stumped him. He had bruises all over his face, all over his chest, all over his arms, even to his fingers, even to his legs, his stomach, everything. The last conversation mom Patricia would have with her son was that he had a run-in with some disruptive teens at the complex. Police say the 28-year-old security guard documented the exchange with the teen smoking marijuana in his report that night and called it into his employer. Candidly, we have identified our suspects on this. We now know the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. So this individual who is a part of this community still needs to know that we're not going to quit. He cannot sleep at night without looking over his shoulder. Corporal Detective Johnny Capicelli is part of Chesterfield's unsolved major investigations group. He and his team have spent years examining this evidence and investigating new leads. We are absolutely even more confident. We're closer. Uh, we've had other members of the community come forward. So I feel very very, very good about the direction that this case is taking us. You like the angel from heaven. You don't have to say anything to me, okay? It's gonna keep happening. There are people that are helping us with this, okay? Yes. And there's others that still need to come forward. On this 10th anniversary of the darkest day of this mother's life, her promise. Somebody's gonna pay for what they did for my son, and I mean that. They're gonna pay for that. And her plea. <laughs> Please come forward. <laughs> <laughs> in hopes that the next time she bows before her beloved firstborn, justice will be served. Mama, love you. This is so frustrating. And you can you can you can hear it in in, in Damien's mom's voice. Here's the number 804-748-0660. 804-748-0660. This is the type of case that I've been talking about night after night here. The one where um, a mom is, is, her heart is broken. Her son's not coming back. But no one's been held responsible. And, and how important it is for that to happen. It's got to happen tonight. Let me bring in my guest, still with us, retired FBI special agent, producer on Indivisible, Healing Hate, which is streaming on Paramount Plus. Bobby Chacon is with us. Retired police commander, host of the Profiling Evil podcast, Mike King. Joining us now by phone in Richmond, Virginia, special guest, Damien's mom, Patricia Blow, is with us. Also in Richmond, Virginia, investigative reporter, a great one, with our affiliate WTVR, Laura French, joins us tonight as well. Thank you, everyone. Patricia, let me begin with you. Um, 
I'm always concerned about you. How are you holding up tonight? I'm okay. Okay. Um, Patricia, I'm just going to give you a moment. Um, I want to just get an update from Laura. Uh, Laura, from your piece, and that was, you know, that piece wasn't done yesterday. It was done a while ago. Johnny Capicelli said, we're close. We're getting closer. Um, any updates tonight that you can share with us? Well, I constantly check in with the Chesterfield Police Department, and I did again today. Uh, there's not really a update in this case. They're continuing to work on this investigation. The investigation right now is in the hands of the Unsolved Major Investigations Group. Now, that's really a specialized group. Uh, years ago, you know, you might have called it a cold case unit, but this is a real specialized group of investigators that are re-interviewing witnesses and constantly looking at what could we have missed. And really, as Detective uh, Corporal Detective Caffuccelli said, we know who did this to Damian West. Again, a 28-year-old man who knew this community, who knew these individuals who were causing trouble that night. He even names one of the individuals named Chris. They know exactly who did this. But knowing who did this and being able to get a conviction in this case, those are two separate things. So the police department, and they reiterate this again today, they need the help of the community. They need people in this greater Richmond area to do the right thing, to pick up the phone, to fill in the gap so that they can bring about that indictment and get the conviction they need so that Ms. Patricia Blow can finally, as we enter into this 13th anniversary of the death of her son, have justice in this case. Absolutely. Patricia, I want you to yeah. tell me about something. This was a, a, a young man, hardworking, but always had time to call his mom, didn't he? Yes. And he always called. We talked every day. Every, I mean, it was sometimes it was like five, six, seven, eight times. We just constantly talked every day. And I, I miss them calls. I, I know you do, Patricia. Mike King, that is such mm -hmm. an indicator of the character of this young man that we lost. Your thoughts tonight. Mrs. Blow, first, what, what a handsome son and looked like just an incredible dad. So sorry about what you've gone through the last 13 years. I'm so glad you have an investigator on your side like you've got because it is clear how he feels about not only solving this case, but about being your advocate through the process. These are these are difficult cases, and as you look at the information that we're seeing just on screen, Vinny, there, there appears to be evidence and debris through a pretty large area. So my questions go to, was this an ambush type of event where he was forced off the road or was he pursuing somebody and pulled off and bailed out and ran into the woods? And those are all questions I know that law enforcement has a solid understanding for and an answer for. But then what really happened inside the woods there? And and uh, it, it has been absolutely devastating for mom to see some of the pictures or see some of the information. But we have to kind of keep in mind, too, I, I, sometimes I just remember another Mrs. Blow by a different name who was so traumatized by some of the bruising that she saw on her son, when in reality it was it was just the when the body stops circulating blood, the body kind of pools and makes it look like bruising. So hopefully this was more sudden than a, a terrible beating. But uh, we, we're behind you 100%, and, and I believe this is one that can be solved because consciences catch up with people as they mature. Absolutely. And hopefully somebody's going to get the courage. Bobby Chacon, uh, we're a little short on time. We only have about 30 seconds, but your thoughts about justice tonight for... for it, it, it's a horrendous this case, Vinny. This is just horrendous. This The brutality of this for against a man who was doing nothing but trying to help that community. He was out there trying to keep that community safe and do the right thing. That community now owes him. They, they owe him right. to come forward and say what they know because that's he died protecting them. He died doing that's the right, right thing, keeping their community safe.
And they owe it to him to come forward and say what they know. The police know enough. They probably just need one little pe more piece, it sounds like. So, so this community, this man gave his life for the protection of this community. They owe him a debt now, and it's time to repay that debt. Well stated, Bobby. Uh, Patricia, we're out of time tonight, but you know we will continue to cover this until you get justice. Um, our, our thoughts are with you tonight and every night. L Laura French, WTVR, thank you so much for your great reporting. Mike King, Bobby Chacon, always a pleasure. Still ahead. In Los Angeles, California, a man suspected of DUI forced to give a blood sample dies in police custody. We take a look at this tragic video with our own law enforcement experts. You're bringing the fight to this, not us. I'm not fighting it at all. And in Kenosha, Wisconsin, an officer working security in a middle school puts his knee on a 12-year-old girl's neck. Why would an officer put his knee on anyone's neck in 2022? We answer the question during crime time.
It is crime time here on Closing Arguments. Let's bring in tonight's guests. Joining me, Assistant Chief Jailer, former Chief of the Major Crime Section, Lieutenant... Oh, no, that is Lance LaRusso first, folks. There you go. We got him backwards. I'm sorry. Uh, Lance has over three dozen years of experience in law enforcement. He has trained civilians, officers, and supervisors as a firearms and defense tactics instructor. He is certified in hostage negotiation, and he is the author of When Cops Kill and Blue News. Also with us, folks, Assistant Chief Jailer, former chief of the Major Crime Section, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee III. Adam served as a police officer for 30 years. He oversaw homicide cases, robberies, special victims units, and a gun assault team. Lance and Lieutenant Colonel, great to have you both back here tonight. And, and uh, tonight's uh, segment is, is a little bit different, and it's because of a, a very shocking video that we came across that I want your expertise to give us some context and perspective on. Uh, but it brings us, really brings us back uh, a couple of years uh, to the case involving George Floyd. Uh, when that case first happened and the first time we all saw that video, um, the arrest of George Floyd is something that, um, you know, we had a trial about it. We, we, we saw it. It is something that absolutely uh, changed the country in many, many different ways because of how shocking it was what exactly happened to George Floyd when he was arrested um, and when we saw Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck. And it was the knee, it was that image. And I know it's tough to watch still today, but it was that image and the, how raw the video was that struck a chord with so many people. Well, tonight we're going to talk about a case involving uh, a man named Edward Bronstein. And Edward Bronstein um, also died in police custody. And um, there's a video of everything that transpired that I'm going to show you in just a moment. Uh, there he is. Uh, I'm going to give you a warning ahead of time. It's, it's, it's difficult to watch, but it's important for us to try to piece together what happened and, and what it means and have some context uh, rather than just looking at a video and saying, oh, this is awful, but, uh, you know, why did it happen? And, and, and what, what is the underlying reason for all of this? So um, Lance and Lieutenant... Lieutenant Colonel, watch this along with me, uh, the video of uh, Edward Bronstein, who is under suspicion of, of DUI, um, is supposed to submit uh, to a blood test, but that becomes the issue as he dies in police custody. Let's take a look. The following video includes graphic content. Viewer discretion is advised. Do you chair? You really did it, do that? That was, that, was, that was the last time. If you resist, if you even... Like this, what if, the hell is important about the court? What it's a court talking? order. It's a court order. It's your choice. Okay? Here, do it willingly How or on the ground. How serious is this? This is serious. Why? For officers of force me to do this? Really? No. You can just provide it and still say you don't consent. That's fine. You're bringing the fight to this, not us. I'm not fighting it at all. I then have a seat and provide your arm. This is your last opportunity. Otherwise, you're going face down on the mat, and we're going to keep on going. You can't do it. Well, we'll do it willingly, I told you. Please go. Stop yelling! 
Just relax and stop resisting. Let me breathe. 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 Stop, stop moving. I can't breathe. The more you move, the less it's going to be, bro. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't So there were parts of that video we, we can't show on, on broadcast television. We just can't do it. But we tried to give a description of, of what was happening there. Um, now, there are no, there's no criminal case here. This is a, a civil lawsuit for wrongful death that the family of Edward Bronstein is bringing. Uh, cause of death, you know, it's, it's a mix, uh, in, according to the ME, what we've read. Um, but again, a lot of controversy surrounding this. Lance LaRusso, I'd like to hear from you first, your thoughts about what we just saw. Give us some context, some meaning, and, and what you think went right and what went wrong here. So from uh, the context of the, the video, the first thing you have to listen to is the officers are talking about a warrant, and apparently they had a court order to get his blood. California's a little bit different. You know, about 11,000 people die every year from DUI wrecks, so obviously California takes it very seriously. They've been pushing very hard to get the laws changed, so they had an order to take his blood. The question is, were they authorized because he was under in custody? Uh, the medical examiner found acute methamphetamine intoxication. Clearly, they were correct in arresting him for DUI, and that's what he was under arrest for. They gave him a breath test. They found no alcohol, so they had suspicion of drugs. Now, the question is going to come exactly whether or not they should have put him in the recovery position, how they were holding him down. But we've seen this over and over again. When people are uh, using illegal drugs, it, it depresses their, their central nervous system. It affects their breathing. And if the officers were using a reasonable amount of strength to hold someone down and a reasonable amount of restraint, the drugs may have taken him over the edge to uh, to cause his death. And that's going to be something that has to be determined probably by a jury or by a judge to determine if their actions were reasonable. Lieutenant Colonel, um, your thoughts about this. And again, I want to remind everyone, this happened um, before uh, George Floyd, uh, before he died in police custody and, and was murdered by Derek Chauvin. Uh, but Lieutenant Colonel, your thoughts about what we just saw. You know, Vinny, use of force is hardly ever pretty. It's it's always an ugly situation. It always looks bad uh, in nine times out of ten for police officers unless the person is really actively resisting and causing some serious physical harm to the officers around him. Uh, my only thing is that, you know, I look at the the, the resistance on on uh, this, this young man's part. How active was his resistance? Uh, I would question, did it take five to six officers to control him or while he was handcuffed behind his back? I, I look at things like that. Um, I try to remain very impartial on it, but it's a little bit un unequivocal to me um, that it probably didn't take that many officers to uh, maintain control. Once he stopped or once he started to resist, it was more than likely a form of panic on his part, because we all know once you get to the point where you can't breathe, you go into survival mode. It doesn't matter if, if it's a police officer on you or anything else, you're gonna fight to, to save your own life. So that's how I see it. Okay, Lance LaRusso, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee III, great, great perspectives. You're gonna stay with us. When we come back, another story a lot of people are talking about, um, a video from Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, an uh, officer working security at a middle school, there's a fight, and he uses his knee on the neck of a 12-year-old girl. Um, this happened after the George Floyd case, so the question I have, and I'm going to ask my guest, is why would an officer in 2022 ever put his knee on anyone's neck? That's next.
0085 now. This is video from a middle school in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, students fighting, and at, at some point in all of this, the uh, police officer who's working security there ends up with his knee on the 12 year old girl's neck. And you can see that video, a lot of folks talking about this. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee III, I'm just wondering this in 2022, um, are there circumstances where an officer should be putting their knee on the neck of anyone, uh, let alone a 12 year old girl? I'm just wondering, because we, we lived through the George Floyd uh, case. Vinny, it's unfathomable to me that uh, uh, an officer would still in this era that we're living in would place his knee on the neck of, of, a, of a person, uh, especially uh, a small, this this is barely, a you know, probably a hundred pound person from what I can see, maybe. Um, the damage that can be done is is so great that uh, you would live to regret it. So I just, I just don't understand why an officer these days, after all we're going through, would still continue to use this type of uh, restraint on a person. Lance LaRusso, your thoughts? Is it still being trained? Is it being taught? Is there, is there a reason for it? No, it's not being trained and it's not being taught. Here's the problem that you have with a video like this. And this is part of the reality of these situations. Derek Chauvin refused to let George Floyd up. He had his knee on his neck for a long period of time after Derek Chauvin was completely motionless and not a threat, not resisting at all. There is an acceptable technique of putting your knee between the person's shoulder blades to gain control over them to handcuff them. I can't tell from one of these video perspectives whether or not he has his knee on his neck or not, or whether she's moving and it has moved to her neck while he's getting her under control. One of the things this shows is how out of control some of these students are in schools. People are complaining about police officers being in schools. Look at what this officer is trying to deal with. He has resigned. He's still working for the department, but he's resigned and basically said, I'm not working in the schools anymore. And it's a real concern, the level of violence these officers are having to deal with every day. Absolutely. Great perspective. That's why we bring them on. Lance LaRusso, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee III. Thanks so much, guys. We'll be right back.
try it free for 30 days. Okay, folks, before we go, I have a picture of a missing child I need to share with you. Please keep your eyes open for Anna Winchester, missing from Hilton, Oklahoma, since February 13th. If you see her, please call 911 1-800-THE LOSS, or you can call the local police. We have the number up on the screen. Let's see if we can bring Anna home where she belongs. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Vinnie Politan. Have a great night. And as always, don't forget to hug the kids. Forensic evidence found at a murder scene.